babies again, those two, the other two daughters, uh, granddaughters. And um, so it's exciting to be a part of that ministry. We're in 1 Timothy chapter number 2, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, and we are finishing up the second half of that chapter. A very easy chapter for a man to speak on. That's about women in the church. So we'll, we'll, let, we'll finish that very interesting study. I mean, we could keep on uh, going for several weeks, but then uh, I would be labeled as something. I don't know what exactly, but a uh, very interesting uh, study here uh, in the role of women. So 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and uh, beginning verse number 8, we'll read down through the remainder of the chapter there. And here's what we're doing is we're getting a glimpse into the first century prayer meeting there in Ephesus. And Paul is writing to this church. Remember, this is a behavioral manual for the pillar and the ground of the truth, uh, which is the New Testament church. Chapter number 1 has to do with earnestly contending for the faith and then also cleaving to the faith personally, Timothy, unless you, you yourself make a shipwreck. Uh, and uh, so he talks about getting a good grip on the Word of God. And then here, chapter number 2 has to do with what we were doing here tonight, is meeting together, uh, putting our hearts and our minds together in prayer and seeking God's throne uh, through the matter of praying. And uh, remember that Paul says, and he introduces this chapter as, first of all, in prayer. Uh, so really, you, we can't do any work for God until we've first gone to God in prayer. And uh, God works through our prayers and works through us and accomplishes His work here on earth. Uh, so 1 Timothy chapter number 2, beginning verse number 8, we'll read down through verse number 15. And uh, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. First Timothy 2.8 it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, and not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not uh, deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be, she shall, she shall be saved. This is an interesting verse. She shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless our study of the Word tonight. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank You for the privilege it is just to take a pause out of our midweek uh, and come together as Your children and see each other face to face and just provide encouragement even if we don't get the chance to shake one another's hand, but even our very countenance here. Um, just participating in this service together as your children. We thank you that we get to petition your throne. We thank you for the things going on in this building tonight, all the precious children being taught the Word of God. I pray you bless every teacher, every child. I pray for all those in the nursery, uh, those in the teen program tonight, the, the counting of the cards we'll do after the Bible study. Uh, but, Lord, I pray for just now, for this moment in time, as we look into the Word of God, I pray that we would truly uh, cleave to it, this light that shines in a dark world. Lord, I pray that your Word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us just to um, put away our preconceptions and just the mold that the world puts us into and uh, truly to, to see uh, what your Word has to say about different roles inside the church. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, so last week, we, uh, we stated four points, but we only went over three points, and we'll see right there in our text. One is the, the wear of a woman, W-E-A-R, wear of a woman, and the works of a woman, the words of a woman, and then finally the why of a woman. But just by way of review, let's look through our text here. Uh, just to mention a few different things we pointed out last time um, in verse number nine. So it says, verse number eight, I would that men everywhere lift up holy hands praying. 
I notice all the different postures of prayer, by the way. I understand why we have our, our hands folded and our eyes closed, especially when we teach our children to do that, I mean, so they're not distracted. Uh, but, man, you can, you can pray anywhere and in any fashion. You can lay flat on your face like somebody. You get on your knees. You lift up holy hands unto the Lord. Uh, the important thing is that you pray everywhere. And um, I would, therefore, that men pray everywhere. And so the masculine uh, is supposed to be the instigator of the prayer meeting. And uh, so men are supposed to step up to the plate spiritually and engage in this, uh, this spiritual warfare. And uh, so God's men, men of God, are to be men of prayer. Uh, one of my favorite preachers, I, I'd rather read his books and listen to him. He is recorded, though. Uh, but Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, when he died, his, his wife said about him, he said, people knew my husband as a prince of preachers, as a preacher, uh, but we knew him. He had a couple of girls. You see him on different interviews. If you have Amazon Prime, watch the documentary on Martin Lloyd-Jones on Amazon Prime. Beautiful uh, documentary. His girls are on there, both know and love the Lord. Uh, but she says, Mrs. Jones said, uh, that people knew my husband as a preacher, but we knew him as a man of prayer. I mean, what a statement to be said uh, about that great man. Uh, so the number one mark of a man should be his walk with God, should be his prayer life. First of all, the men. And then it says, likewise, the women. So in like fashion. Um, so the women following the lead, the role of the men. Men are to lead by example. And um, leading doesn't have to do with any type of dictatorial uh, behavior. It has to do with a a leading from the front, going beforehand and setting an example. And so we see here in verse number 9, first off, the wear of a woman. We brought out three different principles last week. But we'll notice that there is a principle of women's dress, and that is modesty, identity, and then separation. Modest, uh, you see in uh, the beginning of verse number 9, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with Shamefacedness. Uh, shamefacedness uh, is a word that was invented by William Tyndale when he was translating the English Bible. Shamefacedness has to do uh, with uh, the ability to blush. You know, Jeremiah says, neither could they blush. And so this modest uh, behavior, this modest uh, woman would have to do in, um, uh, in her whole demeanor. Shamefacedness and sobriety. And then it says there, um, in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, there's two different types of dress that the Apostle Paul would be addressing here. One would be uh, the attire that would draw uh, attention to the body. So we would say this, this would be like sensuous attire. The attire of a harlot, it's talked about in the book of Proverbs. But then the gold, silver, and costly array, this would be like an ostentatious dress. So in the town of Ephesus, you had uh, great, is the, the, uh, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Remember the uproar in the city there? I mean, they about ripped uh, Paul apart there. But you study how they worship Diana. There was a lot of prostitution going on at this, at, at this time. All, so there was... There was, there was harlots there on the street. So there'd be the, the attire of a harlot. There'd be a certain dress. I heard J. Vernon McGee. I'm going to know J. Vernon McGee. He says at a church one time, I guess some newer ladies were coming, and um, some of the ladies in the church were upset because the newer ladies didn't wear stockings. And he addressed these ladies. He says, you know how stockings came about, right? Well, no. He says, well, initially, women of the street wore stockings to identify what their occupation was. Okay, so there's always, you know, the stylistically things change. So in Ephesus, there was a certain style for the temple prostitute, but then there was the wealthy women. And remember that slaves were going to church and then also wealthy women were going to church and uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're all one in Christ. So there was masters and slaves going to the same uh, worship center. And so gold, silver, costly array are these wealthy women. If you read, you know, Manners and Customs book, weave gold into their hair. Uh, and really they were on display and they were distracting uh, in, in the uh, church service. And so um, we see 
Now, not to broided hair, gold, silver, costly array. Uh, here's what I would say would be the principle of separation. They're not being pressed down into the worldly trends of their day and age. Uh, but instead, they're identifying with Christ. So the number one identity as any believer, as any Christian, or as a woman should be, uh, is this what a woman who has Jesus Christ inside the temple of her body, is this how she is going to portray Christ? So that would be the ultimate question. Uh, and so here is verse number 10. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And we made mention of this, especially us who, you know, are raising little girls, you have daughters, whatever. Um, the world wants them to accentuate their power. And there is, a, there is power of attraction, you know. I was, uh, Brother Dave gave me a book, it's called Five Presidents. What's the guy's name? Clint Black. Okay, so Clint Black... Uh, he was assigned to five different presidents. Actually, when um, John F. Kennedy, he, uh, under John F. Kennedy, he got a demotion, and he, had to, he was assigned to Jackie, and he was really upset about that. But it turned out really good for him because, you know, um, they can write books about Jackie and everything else. Uh, but it, it was, I was laughing. I was reading that book because John F. Kennedy, she was going to go abroad. She was going to go to Greece. And he, he said to Clint, he said, Clint, he's, so he's uh, Secret Service. He says, don't let her near um, Aristotle Onassis, which would be her husband after. And, and so, you know, he was a billionaire. He had a big yacht and everything. You know, if you're, if you're a beautiful woman, I mean, you can be on a billionaire's yacht. You know what I have to do as a man to be on a billionaire's yacht? I've got to make a billion dollars. Okay? And so... Uh, a, a sensuous attractiveness uh, is something that is very powerful. And uh, the, body sa- the, the, uh, the Bible says that, you know, the, the clothing is for the body or for covering that body and uh, covering that aspect. Um, and, and so what, what is a woman to go for is that first off is the I- identifying with Christ. So you have... Uh, modesty, identity, separation under the woman's wear. And then the works of a woman. We see in verse number 10. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So women, Old Testament, New Testament, play an important role in Scripture. And what we're going to say is that they are equal to a man, uh, but their roles are different. They're complementary. They're not the same as a man, but they're of equal importance and different at the same time. Uh, so here is some of the things in the New Testament that women did. So a, a woman brought Jesus into the world. Many women assisted the Lord throughout his ministry. A woman anointed him for burial. A woman stood afar off, beholding the cross. Women observed his burial and came to anoint him after his death. Women came to the empty tomb. The resurrected Christ revealed himself first to women. Go tell my disciples, right? Um, and... Women were praying in the upper room. We see in Acts chapter number 1. Women were waiting on the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 16, we looked at last week. Uh, but we see Phoebe. Uh, most likely she was uh, the one who carried uh, Romans to the church in Rome, that beloved epistle that we love so much. We see uh, Lydia, seller of purple, uh, in the town of Philippi where the Apostle Paul and Silas, they started the church in her house. We see Priscilla. And Aquila, remember that they brought Apollos aside and instruct both husband and wife, uh, instructed him in a more perfect way uh, in the Word of God. Uh, Remember, now it's really sad because you got ladies named Phoebe, Lydia, Priscilla. But I've never, some of you, if you have a daughter, consider this Dorcas. (laughs) And so remember, Dorcas. Peter shows up on the scene and the whole church is lamenting and they're crying and they're showing Paul all the wonderful garments and different things that she had done and all the works around the church. And Peter raised her from the dead and they got their servant in the church. They got her back. So we see the works of a woman. Their uh, women are utilized to great capacity in the church. Number three, we see the words of a woman. Look at verse number 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. 
Now, here is something significant. And in our culture, a lot of times we're looking at the Bible, reading the Bible through 21st century eyes. Uh, however, back in this day and age, in this time, um, you read manners and custom stuff, uh, a Greek woman of a great estate, you would hardly ever see her on the street. She would not have a formal education. Uh, same way within the Roman world. They say even in the Jewish synagogues of the time, women were allowed into the synagogues, but they weren't in the teaching institutions at the time. They said uh, in, on the higher strata of the Roman Empire, uh, wealthy women, only about 10% of women at this time were even literate. So the culture of that time um, thought that a woman didn't need learning. That was a man thing. We see how Christianity changed things. Now, Jesus did not have any apostles that were women, but he did have disciples in a generic sense that followed the Lord and gleaned off his teaching. Mary and Martha, uh, you know, sitting there uh, with Jesus, and he is teaching, he's instructing them. And here in the New Testament church, he says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. So we see that women were encouraged to be disciples and encouraged to be learners within the church. Uh, there might have been a, some sort of excuse by women uh, because, you know, you're pressed down into the mold of culture. Think, well, it's not a woman's place to learn. Maybe they were talking in church. Uh, maybe they were sitting in the foyer goofing off. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. They, but they, they dismiss themselves. And that's a danger. You've got to be careful as adults, too. Adults wouldn't drop their kids off to church and then leave, right? Like, they would never do that. Um, you know, my... my uh, my dad's parents weren't saved at the time, but they would come into, and drop the, all, their, all their kids off at Emmanuel Lutheran to go to Sunday school. And then they all go to the relative's house, go all sip coffee, come back for church and do whatever Lutherans do and leave. You know, they got their good deed done for the week, started the week off right, right you know, got their card punch. Uh, but a lot of times, unfortunately, adults, doesn't matter what age you're at, you're continually be um, growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You're to be learners. Uh, you are to be constantly putting yourself in remembrance of things that you already know. You don't use it, you what? Lose it. I mean, and so you're constantly reminding yourself, you're constantly learning, you're constantly growing. Um, and so don't think that learning about Jesus is something kids do. Like, you know, Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, and Jesus. I mean, like on the same level. Know that if you uh, really have trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you are to be a disciple, you are to be a learner. And so the women were to be learners um, in Proverbs 31.30. Oh, here's a few things. I'll throw this in there for you ladies because I, I know you're interested in this. I'm not, but I know you are. We say, okay, so in the clothing, and remember this is in the context of the church prayer meeting, okay? So you're not to be like drawing attraction to your body, obviously. And then also not ostentatious garb, not, you know, some $10,000 dress you're wearing with, you know, gold studded what, or diamond whatever. Um, so what are we supposed to wear? Some dowdy clothing our whole life. Um, just two instances of this clothing, okay? We're going back a few points. I, I just want to throw that in there for the ladies. Re Revelation 21.2. And I, John, saw the holy city... New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for who? Her husband. And so she's, she's looking good for the husband, right? Here's another one, Proverbs 31, 21. Proverbs 31, woman. Who is Proverbs 31 written to or spoken to? Spoken to women? spoken to a man about what to look for in a, in a good woman, right? Uh, and so this was Solomon, uh, most likely his mom. Who was Solomon's mom? See, there's redemption in the Bible. Bathsheba, a virtuous woman. She's, you know, when you, you know, talk about the virtuous woman, remember, I mean, this, here's the story of redemption. Who is the lady that's pointing to a virtuous woman, right? So here's, here's what uh, is said there about the virtuous woman's garb. Proverbs 31, 21. She is not afraid of the snow, for her household, for all her household, are clothed with scarlet. It's nice clothing of that day. Proverbs 31, 22. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Again, there's nice clothing there. 
So let's go back to words of a woman, okay? Um, but here's Proverbs 31.30. So got me thinking about garb. Proverbs 31.30. It says, favor is deceitful. Favor has to do with form there. If you study the word favor there and, and um, define it, favor is deceitful. And it says, beauty is vain. Um, so we mentioned this last week. You know, a woman can hook a guy on the hook of the hormones, right? We talked about Mighty and John, you know. She's a six, she's a seven. Well, you know, you, 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 hook, you, know, you hook a guy because you're a six. Well, guess what's coming around the corner? A seven. So you try to hook them with the hormones, that hook ain't long enough, right? So it says, favor is deceitful, and, uh, sorry, it's, favor is, yeah, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So remember, the decoration of a woman ultimately is that inner woman. It is your personality. Just like Sunday, um, all these leavens, um, you know, God is interested in working on our heart. He's interested in working on the inner man. And man is that tough work, isn't it? I mean, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness. Like, uh, and, and so the inner man, the inner... So if, um, if, if a man loves a woman because of who she is in the Lord... And she's growing in the Lord, growing in grace and knowledge, and she's growing in her virtue. Is that uh, the other part? I don't care how much oil of Olay or whatever you know you rub on uh, the, the the favor and the beauty that's going down, but uh, that virtue is going up at the same time. That that virtuous woman, that uh, that uh, woman who's growing in the Lord, uh, the woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So the words of a woman. Women are disciples. Here's something interesting for us to look at. Okay, ready? Turn to 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 16. And I want you to notice here, it says, Let a woman learn in silence and subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach or assume authority over a man, but to be in silence. And saying, women are never to speak in church. Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And this proves otherwise. <laughs> And here's another interesting portion of Scripture. Let's look at it. Look at verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. It says, There be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. But I, would not, but I have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. How many of you ever read this chapter and try to scratch your head and try to figure it out? How many got it figured out? Brad's got it figured out. Um, so every man praying, prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one, as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let it be covered. Um, so I want, I want to draw this out. We're we'll, going we'll to read on a little bit farther. Verse number 3, it says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, so we're in a church prayer meeting, having his head covered, dishonoreth this head. But every woman prayeth or prophesieth with her head covered. So here's what we're saying here, is that women in the context of this meeting are praying and also they are speaking. But I want you to notice the context here. So we'll get into the head covering here. Verse number 6. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. 
For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now we're getting really confusing, aren't we? So let me jump in here and just give my little commentary. Um, so this custom in Corinth, particularly for a married woman, was that a married woman would have her head covered. And that's how you could tell the married women from the unmarried women. Remember, uh, I think it's Luke chapter number 14, the chapter of lost things, the woman who lost her coin. Uh, most likely that coin was one of the decorative garments that she wore around her head that would have been placed upon her head at her marriage. And so when she went about town, uh, this would symbolize her and identify her with her husband. So that she, so that people knew that she had a man. Okay, and and so here in the church setting, it says that a man having his head covered, he's not in submission. He is under Christ, and he is to be in the headship. He is to be in the leadership. And he says that, that a woman, a woman praying uncovered or unidentified with any male figure there uh, in the church brings in disorder and chaos into the church. And he says she's no better off than if she was shaven or shorn so a shaven or shorn woman of that day and age would have been a woman of ill repute something to do with the street something to do that so he was saying that inside the church that we all ought to be in submission a man underneath christ and then a woman underneath the leadership of a man notice that they're both praying and prophesying and then in verse number 10, 10, it says, because of the angels did you know that when you go to the lord in prayer that you involve the angels a lot, a lot of times, theologically, we know that. We read Daniel chapter number 10. Daniel's praying for three weeks, right? And uh, from the first day until now, your prayer was heard, but the prince of Persia withstood me. Uh, you know, I've preached from that a couple of times. And I usually label it or name it something like Star Wars. I mean, there's a battle in the heavens when you pray. So an angel sees a woman without an identifying mark that she is underneath the submission of a masculine figure and he is offended by that now remember in the book of jude the archangel michael as far as we know he's the top dog in the angelic hierarchy remember that you and i are made a little bit lower than the angels so that the weakest angel can whoop the fire out of you okay uh and so michael the archangel he's contending with satan for the body of moses and it says, he doth not bring against him a railing accusation. Instead, he says, the Lord rebuke you. You know, what, you know what Michael does in all his greatness and power? He puts himself underneath the headship of the Lord. So anytime you see submission in the Bible, it doesn't mean, sub, it doesn't mean subservient. It doesn't mean lo, uh, lower. It means in subjection to. One of the... One of the um, one of the men of great faith in the gospel record was the Roman centurion. Remember, he uh, says to Christ, I am a man also under authority. He says, I'm under authority and I'm in authority. Okay? And he says, you say the word and my servant will be healed. And that blows Christ away because there ain't a Jewish, there ain't a Hebrew that has that much faith. He knew the context of Christ, that he was submitted underneath a higher authority, and Christ had the power just the same way the Roman centurion did to those who were underneath him to say the word, and it would be done. And, and so here on the angelic heavenly hosts that are principalities, powers, you know, rulers, this, uh, um, this angelic hierarchy understands order, rank, um, and in submission, it says that the angels themselves will be offended at this. Look at verse number 11. Nevertheless, neither is a man without the woman, neither is a woman without the man in the Lord. Both need each other. Again, complementarian. Um, both equal, different roles. They, they're equal in the kingdom of God, but they have different roles that complement each other. Verse number 12. 
For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things are of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Um, so a man, you know, from the womb is bombarded with testosterone. Little boys, little girls, different, okay? And then, uh, you know, Timmy right now, he's 13. He, you know, he's written off marriage. He's sworn off marriage. He's going to live in a cabin in Alaska with a dog, okay? And uh, you don't need a wife. You're going to have a dog. And, uh, but sometime soon he's going to change his ways. He's going to repent. He's going to start liking the smell of perfume. And, uh, you know, that just happens. And, and uh, for, for most gentlemen... You know, when they hit a certain age, um, you can really tell a manly man by his loss of hair. You say, how long is, is you know, so does not nature itself teach you uh, that it's a shame for a man to have long hair? How long is long? Any longer than this. Amen, Tommy? It's a shame unto him, right? And, uh, and so God gave uh, women, and, and most women don't, you know, naturally are, are able to have long hair. They don't have male pattern baldness. or anything. And so uh, God has naturally, through nature, uh, given them a, a natural covering. Verse number 15, But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory for her. Hair is given f- her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Again, this is a customary, customary, customary thing. I remember Missions trip to Ukraine. That's exactly when we were in Ukraine. All the women in church, they wore, and that was something traditional to that uh, place that a woman, a, a woman would wear a hair covering uh, inside the household of God. So interesting there. Um, women in the Bible, uh, we see, are instructors of women and children. Talked about this last time. Um, Jochebed to Moses, Hannah to Samuel. We have uh, great women, Rahab, Ruth. Um, brings forth King David, Bathsheba, Solomon, Mary, Jesus. Um, here's a few quotes here. Uh, John Wesley, you know, about John and Charles Wesley's mother. I learned more about Christianity from my mother than all the theologians in, e- in England. That's what John Wesley said about his mom. Um, here's George Washington. My mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I owe, I owe to my mother. I attribute all of my life success to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from my mother. That's George Washington. Here's a quote from Spurgeon. I cannot tell you how much I owe to the solemn word of my good mother. Uh, Charles Spurgeon's father was a pastor, and one time he was out visiting parishioners, busy with the flock, and the, um, the verse from Song of Solomon came to his mind, uh, the vineyards of others have I kept, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. And he thought, good grief, uh, you know, here I'm letting my children go to hell and going out and saving everybody else's children. He said he, he rushed home with that terror on his mind, and he came home, uh, and his wife was uh, in there with all the, kill, all the children gathered around having family devotions with all the children. Uh, and, he, and he, you know, thanked and praised the Lord for a godly woman. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of George W. Truitt. How many ever see on TV uh, Pastor, I think his name's, well, is it William Jeffries? Pastor of First Baptist Church, um, Dallas-Fort Worth. A lot of times he's Fox News contributor on there. His, his predecessor was C.W. Criswell, whose predecessor was George W. Truitt. George W. Truitt and C.W. Criswell pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas com- combined both of their ministries over a hundred years. One of them was 60 some years and the other was 40, I think 44 uh, for Truett and 66 for Chris- Chriswell or 67 for Chriswell. Um, but George W. Truett had three sons that were pastors. News media there in Dallas was interviewing them and asked the, th- asked the four preachers in the room, you know, George W., and uh, the rest of the boys. Who is the greatest preacher in your family? He said, in all unison, all the fingers pointed towards mom. So it gives a little insight in Scripture to what in the world is Paul talking about, that she shall be 
saved through childbearing. See, she, Susie sells, she, um, she shall be saved through childbearing. Look at that uh, chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Um, this salvation does not have to do with soul salvation. This has to do with a preservation of her own faith. A salvation of her faith. One of the wonderful things about kids is you get to download yourself into the next generation. You have 18 plus, now 35 years, to train up your children in the way that they should go. Notice that it says, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and in sobriety. Let's turn to one place. and We're running out of time here, but then we'll be done. Look at uh, Genesis, chapter number 3. Now, this, this uh, mandate is Pauline. We're also going to see it in the Gospels. Um, now, one thing that Paul said, it says, for man was first formed. So this has to do with creation itself this is not a cultural any you know any church you go to a, a woman preacher up there it's hard to be the husband of one wife if you're a woman but uh, if they have a woman preacher they would they would excuse those verses saying something about how this was the culture of the time uh and sometimes they would but paul said no this goes all the way back to creation itself for man was first formed then the woman was formed um chapter number three of Genesis, and look at verse number 16, okay? We'll read that. I have a few comments about creation here. And um, I'll read you here somewhere, okay. 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Do you know there's only two genders? Um, okay. Last week, uh, week before Easter, the Mega Bible came out, right? Anybody have their Mega Bible here tonight? Got one? Got, all right, good deal. Two, two Mega Bibles in here. And uh, same week, she's got one, one candidate coming out with a Mega Bible. You have the other candidate taking the most holy day. In Christianity, 1.5 billion Christians and rubbing transgenderism in their face. You got 365 days a year, and you pick the one highest and holiest day in Christianity, and um, you blur the gender started in cre from creation. This has to do with disorder. Again, everything. Order in the church, disorder in society. If you can break down the nuclear family, uh, you can break down society, you can bring poverty in society, you can have a top-down rule of government when you do away with the patriarchy, when you do away with the home, and especially when you undermine uh, male leadership in the Bible. Well, I got news for you. This has been going on a long time. Uh, in Genesis chapter number 2, here's the order. Ready? First, God created Adam. He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. In the image and likeness of God created he him. So now Adam has this first thing, worship. Okay? He has a relationship with God. Then God sticks a man in a garden. And he says, you dress it and you keep it. Okay? There's two important things there. One dress is that I'm not going to plow the ground for you. You plow the ground. He says, even in the hills, he says, you go up there and mine the, the uh, minerals out of the hills. He says, it just, I've made you in my image. I brought order out of chaos, Genesis 1, 2. You do the same in your garden. So first a man needs to have worship. Then he needs to have work. Now he's ready for a woman. Guys are interested in things, by the way. Two dudes are talking. Hey, what do you do? Two women talking will say, hey, what do you do? Women are geared towards relationships. Guys are geared towards things. He that findeth a wife findeth a good what? Thing. I found this thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
It's really good. It's not good for a man to be alone. And so don't talk to me about my daughter until you have worship, work, and then you're ready for a woman. He's supposed to dress it, and then he's supposed to keep it. You know why they put a wall around the Garden of Eden? For protection. You know why God says keep her? And also he gave her his word. It's because he was supposed to protect, provide for, and protect his wife. He's playing video games on the couch. She's having a conversation with Satan. Okay? She is a religious leader of the home at the time. He's supposed to be protecting her. She is deceived. She thinks she's doing right. She thinks she's being godly by partaking of the fruit. The man was not in deception. So when a man follows a woman spiritually, he is going to be led into destruction. Very simple pattern. Um, So look at verse number 16. He says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. And she's going to be saved with this wonderful strong bond this unlike any other bond in the world uh is between a woman and her children and it says and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee um because of the fall a woman is going to desire to reign over her husband but he is going to rule over her now here's what christ is trying to do so i make a point sarah um (laughs) Inside the local New Testament church, this is supposed to be a place where Jesus Christ rules and reigns. Christ is the head. We follow him through his word. That's how he rules and reigns in the church. It's his word. <laughs> it has nothing to do with my word. As all I'm supposed to do is water, you know, I'm the water boy, carrying the word. But inside a local New Testament church, it's not to fit the mold of what's going on outside of the church. So inside of the church, there's going to be some spiritual leadership and that spiritual leadership is supposed to be the men of the church stepping forward remember where the man you know adam wasn't doing his due diligence he wasn't doing his due responsibility here's a challenge for men tonight is be a man and step up spiritually and take the lead and the rest of the congregation will be protected from spiritual deception. So let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you just for the understanding Scripture gives us. And Lord, uh, what we cover tonight is completely 100% against what we'd be taught outside of this building and secular society. Uh, But Lord, help us to um, follow your pattern, pattern put forth uh, since the fall of man. And Lord, I pray that you would help us. We thank you just for... uh, the roles, the equal, the, um, the significant roles of men and women, equally important, different in their capacity, Lord. But we, we thank you just for uh, just the pattern set forward in Scripture. We pray you just bless us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, if you can at all. If you can count much for tuning into the services of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church. We wanted to tell you about our new app that you can go to the app store right now and find the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church app. And there on our app, you'll find all of our services there. You'll find all of our music specials. Also, we have podcasts. We have blog posts there. And uh, you can look up our coming events. You can sign up for events there. And it's a beautiful new application. We're very excited to tell you about it. And please go right now and download that app God bless you, and we'll see you next time.